So I want to start off this way. Let me ask you a question. When you see this, when you see a cape, or you think about a hero, what are, what's, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And this is uh, where you guys participate, so I need some crowd participation. Name, name me some heroes that you think about when you hear that word, or you see a cape like this. Man, I look good. I look... Okay, Batman, Superman, what else? It's too kind, too kind. Batman, Superman, joke, all right. Anything else? What are some other ones? Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, okay. So we got a theme here. All right. For myself, these are a couple of heroes that, that come to mind when I, when I hear that word or I see a cape or just the idea of what it means to be a hero. This first one right here. <clears throat> what about this guy? Any Star Wars fans out there? All right. Mr. Luke Skywalker, responsible for helping over take and, and shut down the evil empire. Couldn't have done it without him. All right, next one. How is this? Any Hunger Games? I hear the whistle. Very good. Cadness Everdeen, Hunger Games. Fantastic series. If you haven't watched it or read the books, check it out. Uh, she is responsible for just, just kind of unknown character who steps up and says, listen, I'll sacrifice. I'll, uh, I'll be tribute so that I can go and help overthrow the capital. Incredible story. Uh, next one. Oh, this guy. Mr. Frodo Baggins. All right, so let me, let me ask, um, uh, not many of you, but let me, let me just see this. Star Wars, raise your hand for Star Wars. Lord of the Rings? Or you just don't care. How about that one? Okay, there you go. Um, I think we're all familiar with Frodo Baggins. It helps take this ring on this mission and get it to Mordor to destroy it and save Middle Earth, right? Next one. One of my favorites. Dr. Martin Luther King, responsible for trying to bring unity amongst two races that were clashing. Incredible man, incredible story. When we look at these pictures, we see heroes. And why? Why? What makes a hero a hero? And typically we think someone who's willing to make sacrifices. Someone who's potentially willing to lay down their life for someone. Someone who advocates for the oppressed or the less fortunate. Someone who fights for the rights and the freedoms of others. Maybe people who use their skills, whatever that may be, for just the good of society. And I think we can all agree that we want our heroes to exhibit one, if not all of those qualities, all those characteristics. But I want to ask you another question this morning. What happens... For you, when you look inside of this, what do you see? Do you look in here and you see a hero? You see, okay, yeah, I'm not nothing special. I don't have laser vision. I can't fly. But I feel like I've got qualities of a hero. I'm willing to, to make sacrifices. I'm willing to put others before myself. I, I can see, a, a genuinely can see a hero in myself. And for some of you, your confidence allows you to see a hero. But maybe for others of us, you look in that mirror and you think, well, that's cool, but you don't know my story. You don't know where I've been, and there's no way that when I look into this mirror that I see a hero. I don't have what it takes. I'm not qualified. I'm not able to be a hero. And your insecurities caused you to not see a hero. If that is you this morning, the second one, if your insecurities stop you from being able to see a hero when you look into this mirror, just as an aside, just real quick, I want to tell you this, and I want you to hear this if you don't hear anything else, that God can do way more with your insecurities than you could ever do with your own abilities. Let me say that again. God could do way more with your insecurities than you could ever do with your own abilities. God doesn't need us to be wonderful. He needs us to be willing. He doesn't need us to be wonderful. He needs us to be willing. And when we look back throughout history, and we look at the story of God unfolding, he is regularly doing way more with way less. Character after character, story after story. <clears throat> but regardless of what you might see when you look into this mirror, which hopefully by the end of this time, our time this morning, you, you see somebody that's at least capable of being a hero. But what if instead of just seeing a hero, we were actually meant to see something more? 
something a little bit more impactful, something a little different? What if instead of thinking or wishing we saw a hero, we actually saw what we were meant to be, what God created us to be, which is a hero maker? Instead of a, seeing just a hero, we, were, we see what we we're truly meant to be, which is a hero maker. What do I mean by that? What does that look like? We'll come back to that. But the reality is this. <clears throat> behind every hero is a hero maker. Behind every hero is a hero maker. Because if it wasn't for this guy, who knows where Luke would have been in his journey to help overthrow the empire? Who knows if he would have had the, the skills or the, or the courage to be able to uh, embrace that task. Or what about this one? <clears throat> if it wasn't for Hamish and his willingness to come alongside of Katniss and teach her all the things about Hunger Games, who knows what it could have looked like for her? Who knows how that would have turned out? Or what about this one? <clears throat> if it wasn't for Gandalf identifying Frodo and coming alongside of him, and saying, hey, buddy, you got this. It's your turn. Who knows if he would have made it to the mountain? Or if it wasn't for this guy right here, <clears throat> Benjamin May, who came alongside of Dr. King and said, hey, listen, I want to love you. I want to help you. I want to support you. I want to encourage you in this journey to bring unity among races. Who knows if he would have had the courage if he hadn't come alongside in his spiritual journey, his emotional journey, to embrace the task of fighting for unity. Behind every hero is a hero maker. But what does that mean? What does it look like? My goal this morning for us is to be able to kind of shift our mindsets a little bit. Instead of just thinking about um, the hero or believing the lie that we're not qualified to be a hero, I want us to wrestle with a different idea, maybe shift away from just thinking about what it means to be a hero to the idea of being a hero maker like these guys. How is one supposed to do that? What does that look like? I also want us to be able to walk away asking one foundational question that all hero makers are constantly asking themselves, which is this, who am I putting a cape on? Who am I personally putting a cape on? And, and we're going to do that this morning by look at, looking at two stories. <clears throat> the first one is over here. We're going to dive in to the story of a, of a guy that we look at in the New Testament, in the Gospels. And this guy it does an incredible job of modeling what it looks like for us to be a hero maker. What, what are the qualifications? What do you do <clears throat> when it comes to being a hero maker? How do you do that successfully? So that's one story over here. Simultaneously, we'll look at a story over here on this side, maybe a little bit more uh, relevant, uh, a newer, uh, more uh, modern-day story of hero-making in action that I think will be a little bit more relatable to us. <clears throat> so here's what we're going to do over here. We're going to start, and we're going to zoom into the life of a man named John the Baptist. Now, you may be familiar with John the Baptist. I'm sure a lot of you know his story and a lot that comes with that. And this isn't going to be an exhaustive story of who John the Baptist is, but it's going to build a framework of what it means to be a hero maker. How to model ourselves after John and say, okay, what were the steps that he took that we also can walk in his footsteps to also be hero makers? And here's the deal. I think sometimes we, when we think about our heroes, we talked a little bit about them before, but if we're in a pickle... Um, and we are in trouble and we want a hero, I think we, would, we wouldn't mind if ours looked like this. I think if I was in a bind and the rock came along, I'd be like, whew, man, there is hope. There is hope. Um, but that wasn't the case with John. As a matter of fact, on the surface, <clears throat> you probably wouldn't have thought much about him. You might even have turned and walked the other way if you saw him in, in public. And we know that because in the Bible... It talks about his physical appearance, and it says that his clothes were made of camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt, and his diet consisted of honey and bugs, specifically locusts, uh, to be exact. And so I think it was a little less like The Rock and maybe a little bit more like this guy. Yeah, that, that's what I imagine um, John the Baptist looking like. Any Jumanji fans? R.I.P. that guy. So John definitely left a lot to be desired. And to most, on the surface, he wasn't super popular, he wasn't royalty, but digging a little bit deeper, 
we see really quick that John was the man through his actions, through his life. And even though we're looking at his story to get a model, an example of being a hero maker and what that looks like, he in his own right was a hero. In his own circle, he was a leader. He was a prominent voice for a lot of people. He also was the one who had the privilege of baptizing Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus says this about John. It actually leaves, uh, doesn't let, allow anyone to question John's heroism. Jesus says this about John in Matthew eleven eleven. It says, truly I tell you that among these, born of a woman, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Jesus held John to an extremely high standard, and he respected this guy. As a matter of fact, John also died a heroic death. If you know the story, John goes to Herod, who's the ruler and the king at the time, and says, hey, listen, you're in a a bad, uh, adulterous sexual relationship, and you need to stop. Herod didn't like that very much. And so what ended up happening through this weird love triangle thing, and you can go read about it, but basically at the end of it, Herod had, uh, was, was with the lady Herodias and her daughter, um, who was encouraged by her mom, Herodias. They said, um, Herod was like, hey, listen, I want you to dance for me. I want you to um, you come to this party, and I'll give you anything you want. And she said, okay, well, what I want is I want... John the Baptist's head on a platter. And so John was beheaded and was put on display for everybody to see. Don't get it twisted. John was a hero. Died a martyr's death. Was looked up to in his circle. But more than anything, John modeled what it looked like to be a hero maker. So we're going to dive into... Uh, one of the gospel accounts in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, if you want to turn there, that's where we're going to start this morning. We're going to jump around a little bit. His story's kind of all over the place. But we're going to start in Matthew, chapter 3. The words will be on the screen. Here's what it says. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message, message was this. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said... He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. And right out of the gate, we see that what John was trying to accomplish and who his focus was. But it's cool, we also see how Matthew mentions the prophet Isaiah, um, and, and he quotes this Old Testament book. And it's cool because we see that hundreds of years before John even comes on the scene, that his mission and his goal was a person. His goal was Jesus. The plan the whole time was for John to come on and to prepare people's hearts and minds for this culture shift, for this new type of kingdom, and to get them to focus on Jesus. Let's keep reading. Skip down to verse 11. John says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and to turn to God. But someone is coming who is greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The first aspect of hero making that John models for us is this idea of a hero maker embraces their mission and that mission is a person. The first thing that a hero maker does is they embrace their mission and their mission is a person. John shows us when it comes to hero making that we have to be willing to embrace our mission. And for John, again, it was to preach, to help prepare the hearts and the minds of these people who uh, weren't, they weren't expecting what was coming. But it was all pointed, pointing to Jesus. Now, John could have ignored this mission. He could have nor- ignored this calling, but I genuinely believe that he knew the impact that Jesus was going to have on earth, and so he embraced that mission. So over here we got John's story. A hero maker embraces their mission, and that mission is a person. Over here in this story, I want to tell you about a guy named Chase. Now Chase, he grew up in a Christian home. He had godly parents. Uh, They did everything that they could to help lead him to Jesus. And through his own ups and downs, he, uh, like all of us, he eventually came to the point in the place where he said yes to Jesus himself. And he embraced his mission, and he stepped into this this calling of what it looked like to be just a hero, but also a hero maker. And he said yes 
to that calling. But then what he had to do is then realize and kind of start to think about, okay, I'm embracing this mission. I'm saying yes to Jesus, but I got I to gotta identify my person. I got to embrace my person. What is that? Who is that? What's that going to look like? What he didn't realize is eventually over time, God was preparing what was next for this guy. That he would have a whole field of people to pick from. Chase ended up going to college. He wanted to be a musician his entire life. He ended up going to Bible college, and he uh, started to study. Um, God worked on his heart, and he started to study and learn what it meant to be a pastor and be in kingdom work. And while he was in school, he went and he started a part-time ministry uh, where he was going to do youth ministry just on the weekends and until he graduated. And once he graduated, he became full-time. And so when he, over time, he started to realize and learn that I've got all these young people to pull from. I have plenty of people that I can identify as my person and to turn into a hero. But there was one person that stood out to him. It's kind of that kid, that, that punk, like, knucklehead that everybody knows. It's like, oh, my gosh, I don't want to really be around this person, but I just kind of have to. Um, he realized and he saw this young man and he said, there's something different. He's crazy. He's hard to be around. But there's something about this young man. And it started to plant, I think God started to plant a seed in Chase's mind over time about who this young man was. And so actually they ended up going to camp one summer and Chase was sitting in the back of the, wherever they were at, um, with a friend and a buddy and all the students were sitting down and he leans over to his buddy and says, you see that young man right there? And he's like, the crazy one? He's like, yeah, the one that's just flirting with all the girls all week? Yes, that one. There's something special about that kid. I don't know what it is yet, but there's something about him, and I think he's going to be special. And in that moment, Chase said, this is my person. I've embraced this mission. I've embraced my calling to step into the kingdom, to say yes to Jesus, and I need somebody. And I believe that this young man is my person. A hero maker embraces their mission, and a mission is a person. For John, it was Jesus. For Chase, it was this young man named Jake. My question for you this morning is, who is your person? Who is your person? Who is the one person that you have in your life right now that you are trying or you could make into a hero? Maybe you don't have one currently. And if not, maybe it could be a friend. Maybe it could be a neighbor. Maybe a coworker. Maybe a child. Maybe in this season that you're in right now, parenting is hard. It's crazy. It's absurd. I don't know why we say yes to it, but we love them and we want to. And maybe that's all you have time for is the little ones in your life. Maybe those are your heroes. But maybe as a first step this morning for you, identifying your person is the first step. Because being a hero maker is embracing, means embracing the mission, and that mission is a person. And we all need a person. Back over here to John's story. As a hero maker, John not only embraced his mission, which is a person, which is people, but he also made himself available to that person. He made himself readily available to his heroes. A hero maker is available. A hero maker is available. John wasn't only available to Jesus like the time when he baptized him, but he actually also had his own disciples. He had his own following of people that he poured into and loved on regularly. And because John was available to his people, he was able to accomplish a couple things. One, he's able to have conversations with them, answer questions that they may have had, equip them with the necessary tools needed to impact the kingdom. And we see an example of this in the Gospel of John, starting in verse 22, it says this. After this conversation, Jesus went on with his disciples into the Judean countryside and relaxed with them there. He was also baptizing. At the same time, John was baptizing over at Anon near Salem, where water was abundant. This was before John was thrown into jail. John's disciples got into an argument with the establishment Jews over the nature of baptism. They came to John and said, Rabbi, you know the one who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one that you authorized with your witness? Well, he's now competing with us. He too is baptizing. 
And everyone's going to him instead of us. So here's this moment where John's disciples are seriously confused about this whole baptism thing. They're, they're like, okay, well, what is it? Why are there different types? And why is he baptizing and, and you're baptizing? But, like, they're going to him instead of, and they have these questions. But because, because of John's intentional availability, he's able to give these guys the answers that they need. And check out what it says in, in verse 27. John answered, it's not possible for a person to succeed. I'm talking about eternal success without heaven's help. You yourselves were there when I made it public that I am not the Messiah, but simply the one sent ahead of him to get things ready. John's like, listen, I can only do but so much. I'm only meant to do but so much. We need this guy, and he's the answer that we've been waiting for. And because John was always available to his disciples, to his people, he was able to have conversations and answer their questions. And he was able to equip his disciples with a better understanding of who Jesus really was. John tells his disciples, Jesus is in charge, not me. And a hero needs a safe place to go to have conversations, to ask questions, to be given the right tools to succeed and accomplish what it is that they were meant to accomplish. Earlier I asked you, who is your person? A follow-up question that I have is, does your person know that you're available? For, from the person that you maybe have identified or the people in your life, does your person know that you're available? Can your person come to you at any time and ask for wisdom, for guidance, just to be loved on? When we open ourselves up in such a way that our people can come to us whenever they, whenever they need, then we're able to be an encouragement. We're able to teach and to correct views, understandings, issues. We're able to affirm in them things that they believe about themselves or that we know to be true about them. But if we're not available, then we're not able to accomplish those things. So over here in John's story, first thing is John embraces his mission, his mission's a person. The second thing is he makes himself available. Let's back over here to, to chase his story for a second. As time goes on and he's, he's uh, in this ministry and he's starting to build a relationship with these, uh, these students, specifically this young man named Jake, he realized quickly that he was going to, it was going to take a lot of time and effort. Jake was, gonna, was a lot. He was going to have to invest and make himself readily available, and that's exactly what he did. So much so that, that Jake, uh, pretty much every day after school, would go to Chase's office and he would just be with him. And this, this Chase had tons of work to do, but he said, hey, listen, come to my office. I'm here for you. And he had co countless conversations with Jake on life in general, but, but the gospel, what it means to follow Jesus, um, how to be a better student in school, uh, how to not be uh, an idiot in general, but how to be a better son to your parents. And regularly, Chase said, man, listen, I'm here for you, whatever you need. He would go to his extracurricular activities, his sporting events, his baseball games, whatever it was, Chase said, Jake, I'm there for you. There's nothing that you can't bring to me. There's, there's nothing that you will bring to me where I won't stop and say, hey, listen, what do you need? Chase knew what it took to raise up this hero, and it meant being available. So a hero maker is available. Let's... Uh, Kind of shift back over to John's story one last time. As a hero maker, John embraced his mission, which is a person or people. He made himself readily available to his people. And then lastly, he elevated his hero. A hero maker elevates their hero. What do I mean by that? What does it look like? Well, it can look, I believe it can look different depending on the situation. For John, it came in the form of redirection. There wasn't a single second that John wanted any credit for himself. Again, it was never about John. It was always about Jesus. And instead of being about him and getting credit for himself, he wanted to make sure that everything that he did, everything that he said, pointed everyone to Jesus. He wanted people to trust Jesus, to pursue Jesus, to love Jesus and not himself. And in John chapter 1, 
John is uh, confronted by some religious leaders who are trying to figure out exactly who he was. They were like, okay, are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Um, are you a prophet? And he told them, listen, I'm, I'm none of those things. I'm just a man preparing the way. I'm just a man getting everyone's hearts ready for this other man coming along named Jesus. The next day, Jesus, uh, John excuse me, saw Jesus coming off in the distance, and this is what John did. Starting verse 29, he said, here he is, God's Passover lamb. He forgives, forgives the sins of the world. This is the man that I've been talking about, the one who comes after me but is really ahead of me. I knew nothing about who he was, only this, that my task has been to get Israel ready to recognize him as the God revealer. And that is why I came here baptizing with water, giving you a good bath and a scrubbing and scrubbing sins from your life so that you can get a fresh start with God. John says, listen, there he is. That's the one. There he, that's the one that I've been talking about this entire time. That is who it's about. He sees Jesus off in the distance. He says, everyone, look, it's not about me. This is who it's about. John looked for opportunity after opportunity to take the attention off himself and to shift it and direct it back towards Jesus. A hero maker elevates their hero. And when we shift our mindset to, to not just being a hero or thinking from a hero perspective, but to also what it means to be a hero maker, you constantly are looking for ways to elevate your hero. Looking for ways to celebrate your hero and their achievements, to brag on them in front of others, to just be in their corner, to root for them. Be their biggest cheerleader. John wanted people to see and know Jesus. John didn't want a single person to be confused about this. And I love how John said he would do this. In John 3.30, he says this. This is the assigned moment for him to move into the center while I slip into the sidelines. John's mission was to make sure that Jesus was front and center, and he did just that. A hero maker elevates their heroes. Now, for John, it was redirection. It was a sort of redirection of admiration and attention, but for Chase, it was a little different. It meant elevating Jake's needs over his own. <clears throat> there was this moment where Jake, again, being a knucklehead, he got involved uh, with, some, with the wrong crowd. He made some poor decisions on uh, who he chose to be friends with. And that ended up leading him getting into some serious trouble with some seriously rough and crazy people, um, specifically in a gang. And he had a decision to make where he had to either tell the truth about something that everyone had did or he had to lie about it and get in a lot of trouble. He chose to tell the truth. But what that meant was, if you're not familiar with gang life, um, what that meant was is uh, snitches get stitches. And so he was in a lot of trouble. And he had no idea what to do. But the only thing he did know, the one place he knew he could turn, was to go to Chase and to go to his office and to say, Chase, I, I don't know what to do. I'm scared. As a matter of fact, th these people, they're, they're after me. They're, they're, trying to, they're trying to kill me. And I don't know what to do. So in that moment, Chase had an opportunity where he said, okay, I've got a lot of work to do. I've got my own things. I can either say, I don't have time, or I can say, let me help you with this. And so in that moment, Chase chose to elevate Jake's needs over his own. And they sat down, and, and Chase looked at him and he said, listen, I'm going to be honest. I can't tell you that they won't kill you. I can't promise you that they won't get a hold of you. I don't know the outcome of this story, but what I do know is that you don't have to continue to live your life this way. There's a better way, regardless of what happens now. There's hope. There's peace for you. And his name is Jesus. And in that moment, Jake just broke down in tears. He was scared to death. He spent countless hours praying, Lord, please don't let them get me. Please give me a second chance. I'll give my life to you if you just give me a second chance. And there was this moment where Chase elevated Jake's needs over his own. 
and he allowed Jake to have hope. Chase had an opportunity with Jake to enter into Jake's situation with him, to walk alongside of him in his fear, to be there for him in his darkest moments, regardless of what Chase had going on. Hero makers embrace their mission, which is a person, make themselves available, and they elevate their heroes. And listen, I don't know where all of your stories are at right this second. I know a lot of you, and I'm familiar with your stories. But I'm going to make some assumptions because I think both are possible. Maybe some of you are like, dude, I'm not really sure about this whole Jesus thing in general. I'm still uncertain about it. And I don't know what it all means, let alone the idea of being a hero maker. And that's fine. I get it. That's understandable. If that's you, one, it's okay. Two, I think the cool thing about this story is that you could be a hero maker as well. This is one of the things that I love about Jesus, about following Jesus, is that I believe that his teachings transcend Christianity. They're just great principles to live by, to follow in. So I think you too can be a hero maker. Maybe others of you are like, okay, that sounds good, but I, I don't know where to start. How do, how do I start besides maybe identifying um, and, and trying to make myself available? All these things sound cool, but, but where do I start? What do I do? Maybe it starts of thinking of a person. Then once you've identified a person, maybe you have a conversation with them. Then maybe the conversation turns into an invitation, lunch or coffee. Then maybe coffee turns into an opportunity to pray with them. Then maybe all of that turns into coming alongside of them and wrestling with the, with the idea of what it looks like to say yes to Jesus. Then maybe you have a, a hero that you've identified and that you've made yourself available to so that you can start to elevate them as a hero. We've looked at, I, I believe, some good examples of heroes, and we mentioned some earlier, but I'd be remiss, um, I kind of... Uh, I kind of lied a little bit. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you a picture of Chase. His name's not actually Chase, uh, but this is Chase, technically. <clears throat> I think you guys know this fella. Um, so this is really cool. Actually, this weekend, he's in Wilson, and he is, his father is retiring. This is his dad's last Sunday preaching, uh, and it's, it's remarkable. Uh, Mark has been in ministry for, I believe, 30, 40 plus years, and specifically at um, the church in Wilson that he's at right now, he's been there for a really long time, and this is his last Sunday, so it's cool for him to be there with uh, his dad and celebrate that. It's incredible. It's an unbelievable legacy of hero making. But I'd also be remiss if I didn't show you who Jake was. Um, and I also lied about that, if you didn't already uh, pick up on that. Um, if it wasn't for Chris... Embracing his mission that his dad also embraced many years before that, whose dad also embraced his mission years before that. And if Chris didn't say yes to coming into my life and embracing me as his mission, making himself readily available for me, and elevating my needs over his own, I would not be standing here today. I was terrified when I went to Chris and said, dude, this... These people are trying to kill me. I don't know what to do. But Chris said, I understand. I can't promise you, but I can tell you that it, it can be different. And because of Chris, I too stepped into saying yes to Jesus and embracing my mission of hero making. And before Chris, I was nothing. But because of Chris being committed to the mission of being a hero maker and identifying me as his person, I too became a hero. And I didn't stop there, but I also stepped into hero making myself. And this morning, I want to leave you with this. Maybe you need to do one of two things. I, again, I know most of you in here, and maybe this isn't your step, but maybe you've never picked up your cape in the first place and just said yes to Jesus and allowed Jesus to make you into a hero. And maybe that's a step that you need to take this morning. If that's one, amazing. We'd love to have a conversation with you about what that looks like. We'll have some of our leaders in the back that can have that conversation. 
But maybe some of you need to consider what it looks like to pick this up again and to put it back on and see what, it, remind yourself what it looks like to be a hero maker. Maybe to get back on track, what it looks like to, to start identifying some of the people in your life to say, who is it that I can be available to? Who is it that I can elevate so that that person could then also become a hero and then also shift into being a hero maker who then can also identify someone who can also make a hero and so on and so forth? The last question to you is this. Who are you putting a cape on? Who's your person? Because I promise you <clears throat> that if you aren't, if you were to, it could change someone's life forever. Because it did for me. Let's pray.